My name is Michael Bassus. I'm Westminster's president, uh, at least for the next 10 days. Uh, and it's my honor to introduce uh, this afternoon's keynote speaker. Over a decade ago, uh, Lloyd Armstrong wrote these words. Institutions of higher education collectively value highly their stability and their ability to survive for long periods of time without revolutionary change. Paradoxically, many of the structures and practices that serve to provide stability in the current competitive climate will, will be those that put universities at greatest risk in the coming competitive era. That was 10 years ago, and I think that observation is even more compelling now than it was then. This global economic environment that we're facing, the paralysis of government, and I think the growing anti-intellectualism in this country has created a threat to the status quo in higher education, which can no longer be ignored. As a physicist, one of the areas that Lloyd Armstrong specialized in was chaos theory. So we, he is, we know he is well versed in the kinds of problems we are now confronting. His understanding of chaos actually served him well when he moved on from being a physicist to academic administration as Dean of Arts and Sciences at Johns Hopkins and Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University of Southern California. He has also seen the other side as a member of the Board of Trustees at Altius Education and a member of the Advisory Committee for both Inside Track and Fidelis. I often talk about something called the sigmoid curve. The basic premise behind the sigmoid curve is that nothing survives forever in its current structure. The problem is that the optimal time to make changes in that structure comes before the curve reaches its peak. And this is difficult because we find it counterintuitive to change something when it seems to be working perfectly well. Well, I think with few exceptions, colleges and universities face real problems today and may well be confronted with a crisis tomorrow. And the necessity of change, to change many of our long-standing practices, to adapt to a rapidly changing environment, seems almost inevitable. But determining what needs to change, and how quickly, and by what processes, is enormously challenging, both theoretically as well as emotionally as the University of Virginia is discovering this week. Our, institution, our institutions are faced with those same challenges and the stakes are very high. And I'm delighted that Lloyd Armstrong could join us today to help us think about how to navigate this rapidly changing landscape. Lloyd? Well, thank you very much for that uh, great introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I really thank uh, all of you for inviting me to join with you. You're giving me a, a great opportunity to learn more about your institutions and your organization, and that's very useful for me. Uh, as I started thinking about this, whoa, get away from that. As I started thinking about this talk, I kept reading uh, interviews with uh, John Hennessy, 
president of Stanford. And in every interview, let's see if we can make this work. There we go. This quote appeared. And I said, well, you know, that actually would have been a better title for my talk than the one I gave, which was a very long academic sounding talk. But he's really gotten to the, to the core of it right here. And I thought, let's, let's use this a little bit to think about what's going on in higher education because we can all get this wonderful image of a tsunami. It's a peaceful, wonderful beach we're on and all of a sudden this huge wave comes out of nowhere, smashes down, goes out leaving nothing but destruction and devastation behind it. That's a sort of image that catches one's attention. So let's work a little bit with the tsunami image. And that led me to think that higher education looks kind of like this. I don't have enough room to show 3,000 different um, houses, but we have our sea level there, and then we have different kinds of structures that are built. Some of them are kind of high above the waterline. And, you know, uh, they can stand a storm pretty easily. There are others that are kind of like this house over here on the right, that's really pretty close to sea level. And so it doesn't take a lot of a storm to, to hit that. And there's all sorts of levels in between. Of course, a tsunami comes along, and it's really going to wipe out both of these places. It's just going to be awful. But there's actually a very big difference between the place on the left and the place on the right. I think Stanford is kind of like the place over there on the left. It's up above sea level. The sea level can rise a ways, and Stanford's not going to know it, notice it. So that's why I think Hennessy focuses on the tsunami. He doesn't focus on rising sea level. But in fact, and this is not a political statement, let's continue with the metaphor, there's another effect, which is sort of global warming causing a rising sea level. And the sea level is just going up a bit each year. Not a lot, just a bit each year. Stanford's not going to notice that for a real long time. But this place over here on the right is going to notice it pretty quickly. There's going to be water in the living room before they know about it. And the reality is, I think most institutions in the country are more like the one over here on the right than on the left. A little bit of change is all it takes to sort of screw up our financial model. So let me start off by talking about this rising sea level due to global warming. And this is really, it was just mentioned by Michael, there is a global context here. And the global context really is all of these huge forces that we see crashing down upon us all the time. Uh, there are geopolitical and demographic changes there are a whole bunch of things that go together under sort of the title of globalization. And we see in almost every institution in the country enormous changes that are being caused by these huge forces. And if you look over the last couple of decades, in fact, you can sort of see where the forces are pushing us. There haven't been any big swerves. They tend to be pretty much in the same line little bounces up and down, but they are huge forces and they're not anything that relates to the election last year or the election next year. These are global things that are having a more important impact. The important thing is that generally these forces have put the world in a situation that governments have a reduced power to do the things they used to do used to be a country like the United States. We were isolated from the rest of the world in many ways. If there were problems in our economy, then the government could pull this lever and that lever and it could boost the economy, could make things change. But now we just see the G20 meeting right now and they've admitted there's essentially nothing G20 can do about the world economy because of what's happening in Greece and Spain. The borders have, the, the globalization effects have knocked the ability of the government to do all sorts of things. 
And generally, that's led to governments having fewer resources to spend on what they spent them on before. But of course, what we really see is that governments, by and large, have continued to try to do what they had been doing, but without the money. They've gone into debt. And so the, one of the main drivers of this colossal global meltdown we see is the deleveraging of governments as they realize that they cannot do what they did before. And you can view this in a very simple way. You can view that as, as government in the past has tried to say, you know, we're going to, for our citizens, our job is to look after your welfare. We're to make your life better than it was. That's the reason that you have us in office. But for to look, to look after your welfare costs us a lot of money. And actually, we don't have the money to do that anymore. So what's happening is the government is moving away globally, away from the position of trying to look out for your welfare, to the position of trying to assure that you as an individual have opportunity so that you can make it or you can fail on your own. But they don't have enough money to look out to your welfare anymore. This was actually, actually captured beautifully almost a decade ago in a UNESCO report looking at the state of education worldwide. The uh, underlining part is uh, my emphasis. But they point out that governments worldwide are moving away from the role of being a provider of public services to being a facilitator, a regulator, and a partner. Now, facilitator, regulator, and partner is a very big difference from being a provider. And if you look at the actions of the federal government over the last decade with respect to education, you'll see that it has been moving very strongly into the provider, facilitator, and regulator, I'm excuse me, facilitator, regulator, and partner role. And a lot of things can be understood under that uh, rubric that were not quite understandable when you viewed government in the way it used to be. In particular, and we'll come back to this, there's the question of regulator. They have to set the rules so that opportunity is available. Now, we see what's happening with, in the public sector right now in higher education. We see budgets being cut, uh, terrible things happening all over the country. But of course, we're really interested ourselves in what are the implications for private higher education. To me, there are two implications of all of what I've been saying. One has to do with price, and the other will have to do with quality. And let me start by talking about price. And here I apologize because I'm going to show you a bunch of curves that you've seen a thousand times. But they are, in a sense, at the core of what our difficulty is. These are curves showing the published price of higher education versus family income family income and quintiles over it's a 29-year period, so let's call it three decades. The bottom four curves are the four lowest quintiles of family income in real dollars, CPI taken out. And we see that for three decades, for 80% of the families in the United States, there has been no increase in family income. For the top quintile, there's been some increase in family income, but a decade ago, in 1990, it leveled out. The second curve from the top is the highest 5% of family income. That went up nicely for a while, but then for the last decade, it's been flat. To see family income that's still being increasing, you have to go to the top 1% of family incomes. The top curve is the published price of higher education. It has grown at a compound rate of 3.6% per year for three decades. Actually, it's 3.6 per year for four decades, but I didn't put that all on there. What that tells us is that for 95% of American families, 
the cost of a higher education today as a fraction of family income is considerably higher than it was 30 years ago. And in fact, for the, the bottom 80% of families, it is in fact three times as expensive as a fraction of family income as it was just a couple of decades ago. And I just show you this because it will actually reappear in something else. This is how price has gone up compared to some other things. Uh, this orange line is actually healthcare. Healthcare that everyone screams about as being the thing that is killing the, the nation. Well, there's education way up there, considerably higher. And of course, we all know what's happened to the student loan balance. Uh, I saw an article last two weeks ago in the Financial Times that claims that as of now the oop, excuse me the uh, the total oop, oop, debt load student debt load is above a trillion dollars. Uh, they didn't give me a, any source on it, so I didn't put it. But these are these are very large numbers indeed. I uh, say so you've seen that, but the important thing is all of that strikes on this word opportunity. Access to higher education is a very important component of the opportunity that politicians now feel they have to provide for their young people. And these rising costs as a fraction of family income are cutting back on opportunity in a multitude of different ways. And effectively, that is not a politically acceptable outcome. For the last decade, if you look at the congressional record, there have been at least two bills introduced every year, each and every year, that would in some way limit the amount of in increase we could have in our tuition. One example is a bill that would say any institution that raised its tuition above the CPI would have the income from its endowment taxed. So there's all sorts of ways they were coming up with. But of course, as we all know, this has now hit the big time. And from the Democrats, we have Barack Obama's very subtle statement in his State of the Union. Uh, it says, if you can't stop tuition from going up, the funding you get from taxpayers will go down. Well, that's pretty straightforward. You know, we had some hope because in Washington as it is today, uh, we're sure that anything the Democrats say, the Republicans will say the exact opposite. But unfortunately, Mitt Romney did not help us in that way. Uh, he points out, and this is his white paper on education, came out a month ago. He points out that basically the kind of curve I showed you, college has increased dramatically higher than health care. And then he says that Romney... Uh, is making it clear that the federal government will no longer write a blank check to universities to reward the tuition increases. The Republican Party as a whole has bought into the belief that increasing student government um, uh, tuition help has in fact encouraged universities and colleges to raise tuition so that Pell Grants and so on is actually a very bad idea. So we can see that from both the Republican side and the Democratic side, the presidential candidates have told us they're not going to put up with tuition increases that are above the CPI. And of course, we've all heard from the parents, it's a very short thing, they hate the way the costs are going up and they're going to write their congressman, which means that you're going to see continuing pressure on the political side. There's another implication of, the, of what we saw in terms of the opportunity, uh, which has to do with quality. And there's some drivers that relate to oversight. As I said, regulation is one of the things that government is getting into when it can't afford money. And it's natural that as government has less money to spend, it's going to say, I want to know what the outcomes are when I spend this money. 
So you can expect to see more regulation from the government relating to quality than we've seen before. And similarly on the parents' side, they basically say, well, show us what you're doing. You've told us. We kind of believed it when it cost us $100,000 for a degree. Now that it costs a quarter of a million dollars for a degree, you need to do more than just tell us. You need to really show us what, you're, uh, what you are actually giving to our children. So I think the pressure is going to increase to demonstrate the quality of what we're doing very rapidly. Perhaps not as rapidly as the uh, pressure on the tuition. But one thing we should note, this really came up again uh, under a Republican administration with the Spellings Report. It's the first time we had really big push for outcomes measures. If you look at what the Obama administration has done, they've pretty well followed in the footsteps of the spellings. Can't expect any difference in what the two different administrations might do. The problem is, if we look at existing outcomes measures, they all indicate that we do not do particularly well. We claim we do very well, but there aren't very many outcomes measures that would support that. I'm sure uh, that all of you are familiar with these wonderful two-volume works of Pascarella and Terenzini that looked at, uh, gathered together all of the educational research for a couple of decades. Derek Bach, in his uh, interim between his two presidential services at Harvard, wrote his book on underachieving colleges, which was basically Pascarella and Terenzini's data narrowed down and with a wonderful narrative saying how bad we do, which was a pretty nasty thing for a president of Harvard to say. And then, of course, this year we've had academically adrift that everybody's reading. All of these basically say in one way or another that we're not doing well in our outcomes. We don't do what we say we do. All of them agree on one thing. And that is that the pedagogy exists to, to, to make good outcomes. Derek Bach is particularly clear on that. It's that we don't use that pedagogy because it's different from what we typically do in our classroom. So we're doubly caught. People want to see good outcomes in the government. They have data that tells them we know how to give good outcomes, and we're not doing it. That's not, a, again, not a particularly good place to be. So I think ultimately we actually have two problems. We have a cost problem and we have a quality problem. And I, I think we're going to have to fix both of them in a very short period of time. Now, for me, this is, this is the rising tide. This is the global warming. Because this is a problem that's been there for quite a while and we didn't quite notice it until it got up to our doorstep. And I don't think at Stanford they've noticed it at all, but I think uh, for most of us, we are too close to the, to the ocean. So now we, we need to think about how do we rebuild our house if the, if the ocean's gonna, gonna rise. To rebuild our house, we have to understand what the problem is. Uh, we can't just say, well, I, I'm just going to build a better house, we have to know exactly why is our particular house about to go underwater. And that means we need to know what about our current models actually drive our high price and secondarily, or also, and drives our large annual increases. It turns out those are actually two separate problems. They come from different sources but we're getting killed for both of them. So the first thing is, what's, what's the problem? The second thing is, we know if we're going to build a house that withstands this rising tide, we have to pay attention to the laws of physics and we have to pay attention to engineering. We can't just build any old house we'd like. There are some laws out there that constrain us. So we need to ask what are the constraints we have on fixing those problems. Let me talk about the cost issue first. 
we all know there, there's a part of the cost issue that we all actually know about. We understand it uh, at one level or another. Um, just one example. We all know our academic year is enormously ineffective, inefficient in the sense that we, we've got billion dollars of, of plant here and it's only being used intensively a certain period of the time. We have a lot of, of uh, staff and faculty uh, and they're not being used in our educational programs full time. So this is an inefficiency that we have which a number of institutions are trying to attack. You can imagine, I'm sure, a lot of other inefficiencies that you've seen around your own institution. It's part of the way we operate, so you say there's not much to do about it, but at some point, one has to think about doing that. There are also inefficiencies in the way we teach. We don't actually use the best tools for teaching. I just mentioned this NCAT. Uh, there are many other organizations that are looking at this, but the NCAT set out to find a number of ways to teach courses such that you could get the cost of teaching the course down by 50% and simultaneously improve the learning outcomes. And they've got hundreds of courses like that. And if you talk to the people at NCAT, they're incredibly frustrated at how few institutions have picked up on it and done it. But we can, this we know how to do. We know how to teach courses cheaper and we know how to get better learning outcomes. We just have to pick up on it. But it turns out there's an actually a much more fundamental problem. And to this, I know you've all read things by Clayton Christensen, and I'm going to mention several things he said. I'm not actually going to talk about disruptive innovation, so forget that. But you do know that Clayton Christensen, his book on disruptive innovation uh, and on innovation generally was his PhD thesis, and he he found a number of very interesting things there. It set him off on a very interesting career. And his goal, in effect, is to look at different kinds of industry and see if he can find sort of the laws of organization. What is it that's true across every industry sector that he looks at, no matter how it's organized and what it's trying to do? And in a sense, that gives us some hints as to what has to be, that's sort of our law of physics that we have to pay attention to as we're trying to rebuild our house. And fortunately for us as well, he's turned his attention in the last uh, year to higher education, and so he's applied some of these principles he's found to the higher education itself. And the main thing he points out is that if you have a organization that has within it several segments that have multiple, that have different business models. In the end, you, a, you end up with an enormously high overhead. Now, business model, that's just, you know, that's business school word for how do you run things? What are the resources you need to do this? You know, what kind of people? What is the, the, the reason you're doing it? What's the value that comes out of it? What's the sort of scheduling the way you make it happen. It's just the way you do things. In our organizations, we really have three, we, have, we do a lot of things, but we certainly do these three things. We do teaching, we do social growth of our students, and we do research. And it turns out when you look at those, those all have distinctly different business models. They really are very different kinds of things. We run them all three. And they interfere with each other in many ways. But there's a general thing, and I'll come back to the interfere with in a minute. There's a very important point that when you have several different operations going within one enterprise, you can't optimize any one of those operations. All three of them are suboptimized. They're suboptimized in terms of the outcomes and they're suboptimized in terms of the cost. And this is what Christensen points to as the real killer in, in the way we do things. Now, we know that, just as an example, we know the teaching is suboptimized in a sense. 
if we were optimizing teaching, we would get better learning outcomes. We wouldn't put up with the kind of learning outcomes we have. But we do put up with it. And we put up it with it in a sense because, uh, I'll have to say, of, our, of, the, of the coupling between the research and the teaching. We have constraints on our faculty because we have expectations for our faculty in multiple dimensions. And that means we don't actually, at the end of the day, hold them up to the highest standards in either. There are conf conflicts because people have only so much time and so much attention. And at the end of the day, we have to say that's good enough. But it is suboptimized. Now, it turns out the good news is that when Christensen compares what he's seen in other industries to about 50 colleges and universities he looked at, our costs are pretty much in line with well-run corporations. That is, the overhead is four to five. For every dollar we spend on teaching, we're spending four to five dollars on overhead. Now, overhead is not a bad word. There's always overhead. When I'm teaching a class, it took a registrar's office to get the students signed up to come to that class. It took an admissions office to get the students. So there's overhead beyond the pure teaching. That's OK. But when it gets up to four or five, you start saying that's pretty expensive. When you look at, there are organizations that have gotten rid of some of these operations here. In particular, for-profit higher education doesn't do research. It doesn't do social growth. It just does teaching. And when Christensen look at, looks at the for-profits, he finds that their overhead is between one and two. So that's sort of what the overhead would be if we were just teaching institutions and nothing else. So a lot of our cost then is tied up in the fact that we actually have multiple things we're trying to do simultaneously. The complexity of having people spending part of their time on one operation and part of their time on the other, having to switch gears, having to do different things, is a very costly thing. Let's look at the cost increase. It is not unusual, of course, for any industry that has a lot of its costs in people, and the people are highly skilled, that kind of industry, the costs tend to go up pretty fast because highly skilled people are in demand everywhere. There's competition for them. You've got to pay them better this year in real dollars than you did last year. So that's not a surprise. But Christensen points out another thing which is an interesting thing. And let me just go through some of these. He talks about sustaining competition among competitors with comparable business models. Well, your competitors with comparable business models are, are the other colleges and universities that you're competing with for students year in and year out. They're operating just basically the same way you are. And the sustaining competition for us, we were talking about it earlier today, is what we often call the arms race. In order to get those students, we have to build a better residence hall. We have to build a climbing wall. We have to build a better swimming pool. We even have to build a better physics lab. But that's our sustaining competition. All right, to go along there. Then the great clause, which lack economies of scale. Well, we basically lack economies of scale. For us, an economy of scale is to put five more students in a lecture hall. But that's not a real economy of scale. But if that's the case, and this is across hundreds and hundreds of industries, with different kinds of sustaining competition, that sustaining competition drives prices up 6 to 10% a year in nominal terms. That's almost exactly what we've got. We've got 3.6% plus inflation, which gets us up to 6 or 
So the cost increases that we see are very much in keeping with what is seen in industry when people are just trying to compete with each other. And indeed, we have to compete with each other. So we get some conclusions out of this set of discussions, which are not particularly wonderful. And that is that attacking either the high increase or the high cost is very difficult to do within the current model that we had. It is not simply inefficiency. There is a little bit of inefficiency. As I say, if we operated year-round full blast, that would be more. But the problem is, it turns out, we are not particularly inefficient compared to anything else in industry. So all the complaints you hear about your faculty, that all the costs are due to inefficient administrators, you can now tell them that's not true, that you're really very good administrators, and there's data out there from Christensen to show it. However, what that tells us is that significantly uh, managing those costs require us to decrease the complexity if we want to lower the overhead. Now that sounds simple, but your comp that complexity, that interleaving of your teaching, research, and social growth is your brand. That's who you think you are. So that's not a simple statement that you have to decrease that in some way if you really want to get the cost down. And the price per unit, well, the way the industry handles that is it finds a scale and it sells more. That's not typically something we like to do either. We tend to think of our family who comes to our campus, and that's the people we're supposed to teach, and that's what we need to do. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about economies of scale and what one might do. But I will point out one thing. The, one of the reasons that our sustaining innovation is so expensive is that we're spending it on sort of physical things, like climbing walls, like a wonderful new dining hall, all of those things. If there were some way to turn sustaining competition into a race on learning outcomes, come to our school and you will learn more than you will at the competitive school. That would change that equation enormously because a lot of the ways to increase learning outcomes turn out, in fact, to be less expensive than some of the things we're doing, as NCAT has shown. So if we could change that argument for sustaining innovation, we could change our cost structures very significantly. However, since our industry has steadfastly refused to consider learning outcomes, it's not likely that will happen. So we need to think about, really, what are the uh, economies of scale that we can look at. The, Online learning is the thing everybody talks about. I think it's probably the most uh, um, likely way that we can get economies of scale. But I will point out that the University of Phoenix developed economies of scale two decades ago before there was an internet, before there was online education. It can be done with physical space, uh, but it's easier with online learning. Christensen gives us another bit of good advice there, though. If you want to get more students, if you try to attract more students who are like the students you currently have, that's going to be hard. Because people who go to a place like your institution are already either going to your place or going to one of your competitors. So if you try to get more students like you currently have, it means you're just fighting over slices of a pie. You may win a little bit, but you're not going to win a lot. You're trying to get students who are already consuming your product. Christensen points out that if you really want to increase sales, you've got to compete against non-consumption. You've got to find a group who is not currently consuming the quality of education that you can offer. Well, who's that likely to be? Well, 
first of all, we know, we know what the growth in higher education is going to be. It's going to be in lifelong learning. That's where the growth is. Already, only 25% of undergraduates fit all of these definitions of traditional. So already a lot of students who are getting bachelor's degrees right now are not traditional students. And 40% of current undergraduates are only part-time. They don't partake in a lot of things that people such as ourselves who runs a residential kind of college think is important. We think it's really important that the students are there in the evening, in the afternoon, after class, and partake in all sorts of activities. Well, there's already 40% of the students who really aren't doing that. So there's a lot of students out there who we could begin to try to target. I will point out that the other potential growth area, the area where there is a lot of non-consumption, is overseas. There are a lot of nations that simply do not have the infrastructure they need, and there's a lot of opportunity there. I'm not going to talk about that here because there's also a lot of difficulty there. As soon as you start going into another country, you have all sorts of problems, and that requires a different infrastructure. Now I want to go to the tsunamis. We've talked about global warming. We've talked about the fact that uh, I think that the global warming of cost uh, and quality is going to require us in some way to rebuild our houses. And I've tried to show a little bit about what seem to be at this point in time the constraints on our rebuilding our houses. And it's not going to be easy. But let's talk about the tsunamis. I think once again that Stanford is uh, high enough above the water that they've only seen some of the tsunamis. There, there are some others, so I want to talk about at least one, what I call a small tsunami. The rest of the world has thought this was a huge tsunami, but for some reason it hasn't turned out to be a huge tsunami for us. Information used to be really hard to get, and now it's easily found. Before the internet, it wasn't easy to get information. With the internet, you could sit down and in five minutes you've got more information on any subject than you ever wanted to have. Our faculty, in a way, used to own the information that they were going to teach the students. Their head was filled with information that they had to pass over to the students. Now, of course, that information that they want to pass on to the students is easily accessible to the students and even more information on whatever subject it is is easily accessible. I would claim, however, that the way we instruct students has not really shifted to take advantage of this shift in paradigm. Most corporations have shifted in one way or another, but we really hadn't. I bet if you took a census of the way your faculty teach or the faculty around the country teach, you'd find that the vast majority are basically teaching the same way they were in 1992, before the internet came on. They haven't taken advantage of the fact that information is everywhere, and the real issue of education is what you do with information. How do you put information together into knowledge? And that requires a different approach. And I believe if we ever take advantage of this small tsunami, uh, it will greatly improve our outcomes. And, and I'm sure some of you have seen classes where the internet has been used widely, and the educational process is staggeringly different in those classes. But now let's go to the large. Now I think this large one is the one that Hennessy is talking about, although he has never articulated what tsunami he's looking at. So there could be another one. And this is a parallel one. Curriculum used to be very hard to get. All this stuff put together. Curriculum, uh, the, the facts, the ways of thinking about things, the, the, the ways to test for whether students have learned it or not, all of that was hard to get, and we basically had to hire a faculty member to get it. 
But now, all of a sudden, there is curriculum everywhere. When you look out there, curriculum ready to be had. And increasingly, it is at all quality levels, from the very, very lowest to the very highest. And interestingly, it's almost always now the new curriculum that's coming out there is being built using absolutely the best pedagogy that we know at the present time. So that some of this curriculum is really quite spectacular. Now who's producing this stuff? Well, a lot of it's being produced by the, the traditional booksellers. They figured they had hired your best faculty to create a textbook 20 years ago, and now they'll go out and hire your best faculty to put together a whole course where they bring that faculty together with pedagogical experts and with um, multimedia experts and really turn out a package that's a killer. Uh, they're working very hard. Pearson's in a collaboration with Carnegie Mellon's Learning Center. Carnegie Mellon has one of the best learning centers in the country. Uh, Kaplan is also a member of that group. So they're working as hard as they can to pull down the best uh, pedagogy that exists today into the stuff they're turning out. Now, of course, as they charge you a lot for your books, the textbooks, they charge you a lot for this curriculum as well. But we're also suddenly seeing an enormous amount of free courseware. The Open Courseware Consortium is just one of the consortia. The MIT Open Courseware, which is basically all of the undergraduate MIT courses, is in the Open Courseware Consortium. Um, Yale's uh, uh, general education courses are all in the Open Courseware Consortium. You see a lot of major universities that have put some of their courses into the Open Courseware Consortium, which then you can just download. You can cut it up, you can splice it, you can mix it anything way you want to. That's fine, it's Open Courseware at this point. It is typically, at this point, not made using particularly good pedagogy. The Yale material is just films of faculty giving a lecture. So it's free, but it has some drawbacks. I think probably the real tsunami that uh, Hennessy was talking about is really a bunch of things that have literally appeared in the last six months. MITx, and I want to talk a lot more about MITx. I'll come back to it. Stanford, of course, his own institution that ran a couple of courses that had 200,000 people worldwide sound, sign up, and that clearly caught Hennessy's attention. One of the faculty who did that, of course, has spun off his own company, and he is basically getting the best faculty he can find from around the country and around the world to do new courses for uh, for his new company. Uh, standing behind him, actually, are a number of universities. Stanford is working with them. UC Berkeley is working with them. A number of the East Coast powerhouses. So although Udacity appears to be a for-profit out there by itself, it's got a lot of, of uh, big universities standing behind it. I want to talk a bit about MITx, because MITx is a very special change. MITx is the second generation of MIT's open courseware. They've come up with some brand new courseware software, if you will. Their goal is to put all their undergraduate courses eventually on this new software, which has much better pedagogy than the old. There are some super pedagogy people at MIT, and so I'm sure they're, they're working hard on it. MIT has been very explicit. First of all, I should say all the courses in this bottom line are for free. They may, at the end of the day, have some small charge for taking tests at the end to see if you did it. But this is basically free courseware from all of these. MIT X expects it will have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people using their courseware around the world. And they will be monitoring absolutely everything those students do. 
And then they will be learning things which they, over the next decade, will be pushing back into MIT with the goal of revolutionizing the way MIT does education. And I think that the seriousness of this is taken by the fact that as the current president is stepping down, when asked what was going to be happening to MIT in the next decade, she named three things that were of incredible importance to the future of MIT, one of which was MITx. The second important thing is that the provost at MIT who did this MITx was made president almost immediately upon the present president stepping down. It was the shortest search in the history of a major university. So it's clear MITx is at the center of the future of MIT in their view. So this is a very big change. In particular, all this free courseware is a big change. This is a massive change because there are big guns behind it. And the fact that Pearson, McGraw-Hill, and others are throwing enormous resources into uh, the learning. I've been told that, that Pearson has just set up something like a $300 million program to figure out how to measure outcomes. You know, it's not so good for us. Pearson wants to be the group that sets what outcomes should be from college courses, but it shows how much they think this is a growth field. Now, instead of viewing this as a tsunami, though, which I think has this awful aspect of wiping everything out, we should view this as providing us with some opportunities. And it has changed the a lot of the discussion and conversation in higher education because of things that can happen. We're seeing for the first time organizations, many of them, I just mentioned one of them, University of the People, whose goal is to provide a free college degree. Now, they also may charge a little bit at the end of the day for uh, testing. The University of the People is a very reputable group. UNESCO loves them. They think they're the, they may be the, the solution to higher education problems globally. The foundations, the big foundations in the US love them. They have a great group. The, uh, the provost at uh, the University of the People is the former provost from Northwestern who was there for the enormous growth of Northwestern. Their deans are people from Columbia and, and uh, NYU. They basically use that open source software. They use the money they're getting from UNESCO and from the foundations to cut it into pieces, clip it apart, put it together using better pedagogy than it per currently has so that they can get better learning outcomes and spending money on ways to measure learning outcomes. So this is a very serious thing. They, and as I say, there are, there are half a dozen organizations that are showing to the world, or intend to show to the world, that you can actually create a reasonably high quality degree for essentially no cost. And that, of course, is going to feed into the conversation that the politicians are having about our cost. And we shouldn't ignore that particular thing at all. There are a number of other organizations taking advantage of this. Again, I mentioned just one of them, Straighter Line. Straighter Line is one that um, has basically simplified its actions more, as with the University of the People. It doesn't do any research. It doesn't do any social growth. It just does education. But it just does the first two years. They look around and they say, those are the money years. And they are. You know that the first two years are your money years. Those are the years you can have larger classes so you can afford smaller classes in the last two years. Straighter Line and some other companies like them would like to take away those students from you. So Straighter Line is using some of this free software. Again, they're spending all of their money bringing the pedagogy in, making better courses, their courses are all approved by 
uh, ACE and other organizations as being uh, college level courses. They charge a thousand bucks for the freshman year. And that's, a, that's an all in price. The freshman year can actually spread out over four years, or you can do it in six months, or whatever it is. That's one of their pricing pans. You can also do it by the month and take as many courses as you want to during that time. But their goal is to get the price down for two years to about $2,000. And their pitch is to students, sure you want a diploma from a fancy place. Come to us for two years for $2,000 and then switch into this other place. Pay them the $30,000 a year. You'll get the diploma and you've only paid half as much money. Well, they, you know, they get a lot of students that are signing up. They're also, I, I put, they're supportive of us as well. They're supportive in the sense that most of our institutions have some slots that are free in the last two years because of students that have dropped out for one reason or another. If we could fill up those slots, it would help our budgets. Straighter Line can come to you and say, here, I've got some students for you. They've taken these two years of courses. I can tell you exactly what they know, and you can decide if you want them. So that's another group that's coming in to, to do something different. But what's it mean for us? Well, this courseware can do something, can do many things. If you think about it a minute, the fact that you use textbooks has lowered your costs enormously. If each and every one of your faculty had to reinvent the wheel, you brought them in and said, I, I want you to teach the beginning course in economics. And they had to sit down from scratch and say, how am I, how am I going to do this? It would take them an enormous amount of time, and your costs would go up enormously. So long ago, we accepted the idea that we would, in fact, allow the book producers to, in effect, kind of tell us what our curriculum should be. Now, we don't all use the same textbook. But we've picked some, each faculty member has picked some book publisher who structures the curriculum. Now, the way it's structured ranges from some faculty, as the students tell us, just get up and read the textbook. Other faculty who are more responsible see this as a textbook that sort of provides a general outline and they provide a lot of us supplementary material, and they help the students through it. There are many other ways to do it, but the point is, in some ways, we've taken the first step of letting an outside thing tell us what our curriculum should be. We now know that there are these places, like MITx, that are going to say to us, here is a course that in its content is MIT quality. That's a pretty high quality. Or Harvard, it's part of edX, or something that comes out of Udacity. These are going to be high quality courses. And we can think of different ways to use those high quality courses in the same way that we thought of different ways to use textbooks. It doesn't have to be one size fit all. And in some ways, my, my guess is the way we use these will depend upon how close to sea level we are and how badly we have to cut costs. There are a whole bunch of different things. And I've mentioned, uh, in some ways, to me, the open university model is a wonderful one that some smaller research universities are going to have to think about. The open university in the UK, which gets very good rankings from its students, very good rankings from the employers, has about a thousand real faculty, full-time research faculty. They've split the jobs, they've, they've simplified the complexity that we talked about earlier though, by making these research faculty have only a small activity in the teaching area. Their activity is that they create new courses in conjunction with pedagogy experts and with media experts. And then they go back to their research. And these thousand faculty at the Open University actually uh, are about number 10 in the Great Britain in terms of their research funding. It's a good group. 
But they're researching everything. You know, they're in physics, it's not pedagogy. They're researching everything. The pedagogy, the, the courses are put together and then they're taught by a set of tutors. The tutors are actually very similar to the people at the University of Phoenix hires. They're professionals in the field. But the Open University has gotten its costs down enormously by splitting, the side, splitting apart some of this complexity that they had. They're letting the researchers work full time as researchers and the teachers work full time as teachers, almost. But there's a connection. So I think it's one of the models one might imagine. But I think there's a thousand other models you can imagine in which you use uh, this open courseware. I want to go back to Christensen for a minute. Christensen's original stimulus for his original work was that he noticed that a lot of really, truly great companies just failed. They went out of business. And he found that the reason that they failed was, as I said, that they didn't change their approach to fully exploit some powerful new innovation that was being used by their competitors. Now, when I say change their approach, that has to do with with optimizing the use of that new innovation. They weren't prepared to change the way they did things to optimize the use of the innovation. And that then, if you optimize the use of it, you get the best outcomes and you do it at the lowest cost. They couldn't do it. And what Christensen found to his amazement was that the, a lot of the senior administrators in those great companies actually saw the threat. They could see that this, what was happening could in fact destroy their company. But they could not adapt to this new innovation. And the real question is why? Why is it when they could see they were gonna, they were gonna go underwater? The water was rising, there it was. Why not? And it's because adapting meant changing the character of the company and the way it was organized. It was not a trivial change. And everybody who was in an administrative position had worked their way up in that company or a similar company. And that company was considered to be a great company. And so these people quite naturally, deep in their heart, felt that the way things were being done was actually the definition of excellence. This was the way it should be done. And if you change the status quo, if you change the way you did it, excellence actually had to go away. Quality had to go away. There was no other way they could see it. But what they didn't understand was that the customers had a changing view of what excellence meant. And they actually began to like the other way of doing it. And when enough of them got to like the other way of doing it, the original company just died. And I, from our perspective, I think our public is sending us some messages. I think they're telling us we're too expensive and our costs are rising too much each year. And our learning outcomes, our product, is not nearly as good as it should be. We need to do something about that. And I think if we ignore what our public wants, that's the real tsunami in the sense that I originally gave the image of the tsunami coming in, crashing over everything and leaving nothing but desolation behind. When you lose your customers, that's your desolation. We know how to do all of those things up there. We've talked about ways to do it but it's likely to require really major changes that probably few of us would be com comfortable with, just as those people in the corporations were not comfortable with. It. And in addition, you have your trustees, you have your alumni. But of course, the CEO in that company had his board. And all of everyone has these pressure groups that in a sense don't like to see change. But the alternative uh, is not a good one. 
So the question is, if you really need to make a change, how do you go about it when everyone feels very uncomfortable with the change? When this is not what you want to do, but you see that there may be an existential threat out there. Christensen, as he looked at it, found a few companies that had actually managed to survive the big transformation. And it was basically by testing innovation. The companies that survived essentially set up a skunk works, an operation off to the side that didn't have to share in the, in the whole regulations, rules, sense of excellence, anything from the main company. And they would test this innovation. Now the, the, the big example he uses is IBM. IBM, as we all know, in the 50s made enormous computers that would fill up this room. And somehow, the upper management of IBM was smart enough to say, there's something out there on the market called Commodore. There's something out there on the market called Apple. They're really crappy, but we need to be able to, you know, we have to be able to do this. And the management of IBM knew they had actually been trying to make a desktop computer. But it was coming in at about $30,000. And it was actually going to take them several years to build it. Commodore was on the market. Apple was on the market. These things were, were an order of magnitude cheaper. And they realized they had to set up a skunk works. They sent 20 people down to Florida, which was as far away from the New York office as they could get them. And they said, there are no rules on you guys. You do anything you want to do. You got a budget. We don't want to hear from you again, except at the end of the year, we want a computer that does as well as these Commodores and Apples and everything else. We want it to cost $2,000 or under. And from the time you design it until it gets on the market, has to be two months or less. Now, they knew at that time IBM had never designed anything in under four years. And they had never been able to get anything from design to market in under two years. Part of the problem was that everything IBM did to maintain quality was all designed and built inside. Everything in those huge computers, from vacuum tubes to solder to everything, was designed at IBM and made at IBM. This team of 20 realized they couldn't do any of that, that they had to find off-the-shelf stuff. And they did. So they, the processor was from Intel, not from IBM. The software was from Microsoft, not from IBM. And in a year they had it, and two months later it was on the market. And that began a massive transformation of IBM, which left them making essentially no big computers, few supercomputers. IBM has since internalized that process. And if you look at IBM, they've actually changed their field about three times since then. It's one of the only companies in the world that's managed to do that. But it's that way. And I am totally convinced that MITx is a skunk works. It has absolutely all the, all the characteristics of a skunk work. It's quite reasonable. Skunk works is a name that came from Lockheed. It's the way they designed their radical airplanes and such. MIT is an engineering school. I think they knew the story of Lockheed very well. But it's absolutely, it's working as far out of the rules of MIT as they can get it. They have assured the faculty that MIT X will not offer degrees. Not now, not ever. So it's not a threat to what's going on on campus. They've basically, they have a lot of flexibility in how they're doing the courses and all these things. And they've announced, though, that they plan to bring it back into MIT. I think this is the classic way that Christensen saw of bringing real innovation into an institution. So let me just sum up here. I think we see a rising tide of dissatisfaction 
with our costs and the way we do things. And that that dissatisfaction is very dangerous to us. We see both presidential candidates basically speaking out against our cost structure. I think correcting this will require various serious changes in how we organize ourselves and view ourselves. And I think we don't have a lot of time before the rising water gets to us. Um, but these tsunamis, I think, provide us with some wonderful opportunities. And I think that setting up a skunk works to test how your institution might absorb some of these things is a very important thing. The Skunk Works lets you do a number of things. It let, it let IBM see a number of things. IBM had no concept that they were going to get out of the computer field. That wasn't part of their thought. But the Skunk Works showed them a different way to do things. It showed them a new thing. And so IBM sat down and said, let's think about who we think we are. Is it really that we make big computers or are we something else? So if you have a skunk works that's doing some of these things, using some of this tsunami to try to do something, you can begin to ask yourself, what is it really that we aspire to be and, and that we want to do? You don't have to throw away everything. IBM didn't just say, flip a switch and say, oh my God, we're just going to make small computers. Had they said that, IBM would now be dead because making small computers is not a good business. But they began to figure out more about themselves by having this skunk works. And I think that's one of the benefits of a skunk works. You see, you see what the new innovation can do. You see what kind of infrastructure it needs. You see what its cost points are. But even more, you go back and you scratch your head and you say, maybe this institution isn't defined exactly the way I always thought it was. Maybe we do things, we could do things a little differently and have a different mission, a different view of things. It forces you to think in a way that is very hard to think when you're just sitting in your office uh, trying to keep your head above that water that's coming up. So I suggest you need to pick something, think about your institution, and set up some operation that you make as free as possible from the prejudices that are built into your institution. And I think you need to do it now, because I think time is running out. Thank you very much.